Hello everyone, my name is Jeremy Smith. I'm a Master's of Science student at Oregon State University working with Dr. Jason Eidecker. Uh, today's presentation is the durability properties of high early strength concrete with alternative cement and all accelerated Portland cement. So a quick outline of what today is going to look at is an introduction to what high early strength concrete is, the objective of this presentation, the mixture designs, strength development, freeze-thaw durability, electrical properties, and the challenges and remaining work of the study. So just to briefly cover high early strength, um, it's typically defined with a rapid strength gain of greater than 3,000 PSI within three hours. Um, they have high pace contents and good durability and performance. So the project goals are to provide Oregon Department of Transportation with concrete designs meeting all of these criteria using both proprietary and non-proprietary materials. Um, the proprietary materials are calcium sulfo aluminate cements with polymer modifiers and without polymer modifiers, as well as a, a commercially available and non-proprietary CSA that has been blended um, with ordinary Portland cement. And the accelerated type 3 cement is accelerated with the chemical accelerator um, that is non-chloride. So the idea behind these concretes is to reduce the closure time required for construction. Um, ideally, they can go out there, remove the surface, put in the new overlay, and not worry about any curing and just, just go. So uh, we determine the mechanical properties and the durability. So the objective for today, as I mentioned, is the mixture designs and then the strength development for three to six hours um, with and without air entrainment. So then we'll go into freeze-thaw and then the electrical properties for bulk and surface resistivity of concrete and pore solution resistivity from paste samples uh, and then the challenges and remaining work. So this table outlines the, what each of the mixture names means. So if it says PR, it's a proprietary material that has integrated um, admixtures. So PR CSA1 is a proprietary CSA with a polymer modifier as well as the other admixtures. CSA2 does not have a polymer modifier, but it still has the integrated admixtures. CSAP is a non-proprietary CSA with a liquid polymer modifier added in the mixing laboratory. Uh, and then CSA OPC is a non-proprietary CSA with 80% um, CSA and 20% Portland cement. The type three accelerated is the type three cement with 3% accelerator by weight of cement. And the HPC is typical of what you could see from Oregon bridge decks from about the 1980s on, um, and it's a high supplementary cementitious replacement design um, with 66% Portland cement, 30% fly ash, and 4% silica fume. Uh, the CSA concretes used a 0.38 water to cement ratio, and the OPC systems used a 0.36. Um, no air entrainment was included in the samples for uh, the electrical properties, um, and 7% air was targeted for freeze thaw performance. Uh, and as I mentioned, with the proprietary materials, they have integrate, integrated air entrainments. Um, so we have less control in reducing air, but we can add more if we want to. So here's the strength development. This black line here is the 3,000 PSI. And from looking at the data, we can see that in general, at three hours, regardless of air entrainment or not, the uh, concretes are able to meet that requirement of 3,000 PSI. Uh, the type three is at six hours, simply because the reaction just hasn't kicked off enough to test it at three hours. But at six hours, it's meeting um, the 3,000 PSI requirement. Another thing that's interesting about the T3A is at 28 days, it's achieving almost 4,000 PSI when it's not air entrained. Um, so it's really continuing to just um, kick off that strength gain. So freeze thaw performance is following ASTM C666 uh, procedure B. So the samples are being frozen in air and thawed in water. Uh, a dynamic modulus of 90 is good performance and less than 60 would be a failure. Uh, this is reporting the RDME, uh, excuse me, this should be durability factor. Uh, but we're reporting the RDME because if they haven't failed, the it, you can't really calculate it. Um, so here is the sample. Here's an example of a prism being tested. It's three inches by four inches by 16. And 
the uh, frequency or transverse frequency is measured um, at at spacings of not more than 36 cycles. Uh, the freeze thaw machine that we use can be seen in this picture here as well. So from the data, the green line is the HPC sample, and everything above it is um, the other mixtures in the study. So so far, this is still continuing. So far, the CSAs and the type 3 accelerated are performing the same or better um, than the HPC. And it's interesting to note that the proprietary CSA1 and the CSA with the liquid admixture that don't have that typical requirement of 6 to 7% air are still performing very well so far in freeze thaw testing. <clears throat> So for electrical properties, these samples were sealed cured um, and resistivity is being measured three different ways. Continuous resistivity is being measured with a uh, Geotech smart box sensor. So um, this is sort of the full setup on a four by eight cylinder. Um, and this little box here continuously measures the resistivity through the steel rods on this side. Um, heat shrink tubing is put on the bottom and on the section of the top so that there's just one exposed section for measurements to take place. Um, so then we just take standard bulk resistivity measurements at 28 day and then a surface resistivity at 24 hours and 28 days. And we turn that 24 hour measurement into a bulk resistivity using a geometric factor. Um, so in order to get the actual formation factor of concrete, we need to account for the degree of saturation. So we take the degree of saturation at 28 days so that in the future we can correct for that. The pore solution of the paste was done at three hours, 24 hours, and 28 days for the higherly strength concretes. For the, uh, the type three and the HPC, it was done at one day, three day, and 28 day. So, and then the solution was extracted by a hydraulic press. So here is that resistivity data. The bulk resistivity of a concrete is on the top and the pore solution resistivity is on the bottom. So row bulk goes into the apparent formation factor on top and row not on the bottom, and because we're not accounting for the degree of saturation at this point, it's the apparent formation factor. So it's very interesting to note, just looking at 28 days, that all of the um, CSA materials have very high bulk resistivities, and the um, pore solution resistivities are relatively the same. They're different, but it's not going to have as large an impact as this does on the formation factor. So when we look at the apparent formation factor, we obviously see that influence, and we see an apparent formation factor of over 5,000, which doesn't line up. This uh, value for the type 3 accelerated um, is pretty typical and can be seen in HPC mixtures from literature. Um, and the very high values of alternative cements need to be corrected for degree of saturation. From that, we can kind of look at, are these electrical properties going to be indicative of the durability for alternative cements? All of these tests are made for ordinary Portland cement, so we need to evaluate that. So Moffitt and Thomas's paper looked at a pure CSA uh, exposed to marine conditions, and uh, this RCPT value would say the same thing that the formation factor value is getting at, is that it's very durable. The chlorides aren't going to get in. but they also measured the diffusion coefficient, which is very high, so the chlorides are getting in. So how do we actually relate these electrical properties to the durability? <clears throat> so the challenges in the remaining work are that those standards don't exist for the alternative cements yet. Um, and then the early setting time of the materials within 30 minutes kind of requires you to split the batches up. You can't cast 20 cylinders at once. You have to do maybe six. Um, so next on the project list is continuing to determine the critical chloride threshold of these materials when they're in different anodic and cathodic environments. Um, so these are anode samples, and this is a picture from uh, Trejo's publication in ACI. Um, and this is a cathode sample, and they're in different exposure solutions. So this picture is before the mold has been set up, and this bar is five and a half inches long and then it is encased in a mortar with those cements of the study and ASTM standard sand. Um, 
and then we'll measure the half cell potential and look for activation. So you can see that this sample is pretty close. If you know the half cell test at minus 350 or more negative is activation. Um, so we monitor that every day until the sample has shown less than 350 twice. Um, and then the sample is removed and will eventually be um, titrating for acid and water soluble chlorides so that we can get an idea of the um, critical chloride threshold. Along with that, we're also determining the corrosion rate of embedded reinforcement by measuring the polarization resistance. So other remaining work is concluding freeze thaw testing and then continuing to collect, collect that resistivity data with the smart box sensors and then determining the degree of saturation so that we can calculate the real formation factor and then also the pore solution pH with the probe and ion concentration of the pore solution with the x-ray fluorescence. So in summary, we can see that 3,000 PSI is achievable within three hours for these alternative cements and within six hours for the type three. And that type three continues to gain substantial strength out to 28 days, almost reaching 14,000. Um, and the high freeze thaw performance looks achievable uh, currently. Uh, things can change, but even with less than 6% air, it looks like these materials have um, a good opportunity. And then alternative cements produce these very high electrical resistivities, um, which influence that formation factor value to not necessarily be accurate. Um, so we need to establish a relationship of electrical properties to the durability of CSAs. And with that, that ends my presentation.